Zack Snyder's Bat Murderer vs. Super Moron, Dawn of Injustice, is a movie. That is the most generous statement I can make about that movie. Superman is reimagined as an incompetent moron, and Batman as a paranoid murderer who enters into a conspiracy with Alfred to murder Superman. There may be some redeeming aspects to Bat Murderer vs. Super Moron, Dawn of Injustice, if there are, I can't remember them and I don't care. I'm never watching that movie again. However, as bad as Rebel Moon director Zack Snyder's mischaracterization of Batman and Superman was, it is positively masterful in comparison to what is, by far, his movie's worst aspect. We concluded the mineral could be weaponized if a large enough sample was found. And then, among the fishes, a whale. Ah. Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. Um, speech, speech, uh, blah, 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 uh, open bar. <laughs> that performance is the worst part of Bat Murderer vs. Super Moron by a country fucking astronomical unit. The image of Lex Luthor I grew up with came from John Shea's performance in The New Adventures of Superman, which ran for five seasons starting in 1993. Great show, man. I hold. A certain position in the city. Yes. And there is nothing that would please me more than to see you dethroned and behind bars like any common criminal. That day will come. John Shea played a confident, self-possessed, masculine Lex Luthor who was envied by weak men and desired by women. Not because he was Chad, he wasn't, but because he pulsated a dark charisma. He had a magnetic personality. Here's Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor. Because that is paradoxical, and um, <laughs> you, my friend, have a date. Hmm. Across the bay, ripe fruit his hate. Two years growing, but it did not take much to push him over, actually. There is a lot wrong with Netflix's three-body problem, but all of the show's problems are overshadowed, indeed almost blotted out, by the gargantuan trisolar eclipse that is this production's Jesse Eisenberg Lex Luthor. Yeah. You want to know as well. Jack, I love you, but I sort of got if you don't shut the fuck up, I'm going to punch a hole straight through your head. Augie. Before I elaborate on Augie, I must warn you that this video contains major and indeed total spoilers for all three books in the Remembrance of Earth's Past series, more commonly known as the Three Body Problem trilogy. I will be spoiling the ending of the trilogy, character fates, and the ending of each book, as well as many other dramatic elements and major reveals. If you like sci-fi literature, I strongly encourage you to read those books. As with humanity being made aware of an invading alien fleet 400 years in advance of that fleet's arrival, you have been warned. Now, Augie. Augie is a gender-bent depiction of Wang Miao. Wang is a research scientist specializing in nanomaterials. He is a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, has a wife and child, and is fanatically dedicated to his research project, which is ongoing when we are introduced to him in the first book, The Three-Body Problem. When he has time to himself, he likes to take photos of the city with old analog cameras. If, during the casting phase of this project, Benioff and Weiss had called me up and pleaded, My Lord Despot, we need a Wang Miao for Three-Body. It's a Western adaptation, so he doesn't need to be Chinese. Uh, would you deign to offer us your recommendations? I would have answered, Tom Hiddleston, Rami Malek, Eddie Redmayne, Elijah Wood, Sterling K. Brown. Any of those guys could pass as a world-class scientist. They've got that intelligent, passionate nerd energy that you could harness into the role. I would not have said Isa Gonzalez. Shit. You know who else does the exact same thing and does the exact same thing. Barbara Streisand. She does not possess passionate nerd energy. She does not look like a physicist or a scientist of any kind. When considering if someone could pass as a proficient scientist, ask yourself, is this someone who could regularly sit down and study for 12 hours at a stretch? You know, it was real, real romantic. What was real, real romantic? We need to have that guy. If I saw Isa working in the upper echelons of a science department in a major company, the first thought to enter my mind about her would be... The second thought to enter my mind would be... Mm. When a woman this good looking climbs the ladder out of turn, usually it means that she is not so much stepping over people as mounting atop them. But it is current year of the competency crisis, so I would just assume she got her position through the didn't earn it 
program and leave myself open to being proven wrong, though I would have a greater expectation of stumbling into a fourth dimensional portal on a drunken night out than I would of discovering that Augie's promotion to the directorship of a nanotech lab was merit based rather than the result of sexual initiative or immutable qualifications. The casting of Isaac Gonzalez in the role of Wang Miao is not only a bad casting decision, it is ruinous. This is the main character of the first book. If the production casts the wrong actor, it poisons the whole show. It will be difficult for people who have not read the book to grasp just what an abysmal fucking casting choice Isa Gonzalez is. So let's do a few hypothetical comparisons. Imagine if Demi Moore was cast to play Brundle in The Fly, or Jane Fonda was cast to play Doc in Back to the Future, or Indiana Jones was played by some annoying, spindly, vaguely female looking creature that looks awful on a cinema screen. Or Jesse Eisenberg was cast to play Lex Luthor. Mm, wrong category boy, no, no, triangles. Thank God that never happened. Even a director as bad as, oh, I don't know, Zack Snyder wouldn't be so incompetent as to make such an obviously awful casting choice as Jesse fucking Eisenberg to play Lex Luthor. Big bang, you let your family die! Now, to be clear, Isa Gonzalez did nothing wrong. The Augie debacle is not her fault. One cannot blame Isa for the disaster that is Augie any more than blame CM Punk for his UFC uh, career. That right hand missed by a distance so great it's visible on Google Maps. That was the single offensive strike Punk threw in the entire fight. Mickey Gall ducked under it, double-legged, and choked him out. It was very weird. The whole thing was very weird. Like right away when you see CM Punk holding his, holding his hands up and moving stiff and throwing kicks, you're like, oh Jesus. CM Punk should not have been permitted to compete with elite level fighters. And Isa Gonzalez should not have been playing a nanotech genius in a hard science fiction show. I think Jonathan Frakes said it best. As you watch this cat in my arms, it seems harmless and docile. Well put, Jonathan. And let me ask you a question, Jonathan. Would you have cast Isa Gonzalez to play Wang Miao? Have you ever walked through a graveyard? Gender swaps are awful. They are far worse than race swaps. If you race swap a white man out for a black man in, as in the case of Nick Fury, at least he's still a man, a male character with male traits. And I am not endorsing race swapping in any way. Let's not beat around the fourth dimensional bubble here. Race swaps go in one direction only, white to anything else usually black. They are pointless, stupid, lazy, and tokenistic. But gender swaps are cancer on radioactive steroids. They also go in only one direction, male to female, but the resulting female version of the character is still written as if she were a man. A recent and particularly rancid instance of this was Darben from The Marvels. Tom Hiddleston's wife looked absolutely ridiculous playing Darben. Stomping about, trying to look intimidating and in charge, lugging around a staff that she clearly had little physical command over, and swamped in a gown dominated by laughably incongruous 80s shoulder pads which physically diminish her. Darben looked puny and vaguely comical in her disco wizard chic costume. She reminded me of Latina Midget from Terminator Dark Flop, who looked like a toddler that had found her daddy's gun when she was holding a shotgun. Latina Midget was cast to take over the human saviour role from John Connor, who was dispensed with. That turned out well. The film grossed $261.1 million worldwide and lost $122.6 million, making it one of the biggest box office bombs of all time. As a result, initial plans for future films were later cancelled. As controversial as it is to say, and indeed illegal if you live in Scotland, women are not Men. Women can't do the thousand-yard Clint Eastwood stir. Sorry, Bent Eastwood, you look ridiculous. Sorry, Orange Rosario Dawson, you don't look stoic or transcendent or quietly threatening or whatever the hell else you were going for. You look bored and boring. As Call Me Chiro pointed out in response to Ass Oka in a video titled Women Suck at Playing Men. Women can't do gravitas the way male actors can. When women try to imitate male badass, they just look 
boring ass. Women also can't do fanatically dedicated lab rat science genius. It is not a female role. Apparently though, they can do Adeptus Custodes, the most elite warriors of the 40k Imperium. And if you don't like it, you're a bigot. Ha ha ha, we're destroying that thing you love. There are plenty of female roles men can't do. For example, the redemptive anima. Think the stripper in The Wrestler or pre-Botox mini driver in Goodwill Hunting. Men also cannot play the Angel of Destiny. For example, Starbuck in the latter seasons of BSG and Galadriel in Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring. Isa Gonzalez is a good actress. I really liked her in Baby Driver. <laughs> But she is atrocious in Three Body Problem. She overacts, she pours too much emotion into scenes that don't call for it. She comes off as histrionic and try-hard. I'm Chief Scientific Officer and I'm ordering you to shut it down. The character Augie resembles Wang Miao only in her job and her role in the plot. In terms of personality and behaviour, she is entirely the invention of Benioff and Weiss. And as the season of television whose name we dare not utter demonstrated, Benioff and Weiss are not at their best when working entirely off of their own creative initiative. Augie is unrelatable, unlikable and boring. Her introductory scene seems to be designed to emphasise just how thoroughly unlikable she is. She and her friend Jean are in a bar and some guy who, fair play to him, at least has the balls to approach women, walks over and takes a shot. What do you do then? Augie responds in a manner calculated to display not only how smart and qualified she is, but also how much of a prickly wanker she can be. I design self assembling and polymer nanofibers. But hey, at least our boy didn't make the mistake of approaching Carrie Mulligan. What do you do then? Fuck you! Fuck you! Get the fuck out of here! Jean also plays the part of the out of reach, aloof bitch batting away thirsty barflies. I'm doing a meta-study analyzing the results of particle accelerator experiments around the world. Apart from being boring, Augie's other personality traits are anger and self-righteousness. I can't believe you're working for that fascist fuck again. She is angry at Wade because Wade is a bad man. She develops a sense of righteous indignation because bad things happen. And near the end of the show, a messiah complex. Strangely though, her messiah complex applies only to actions which result in instant gratification and not to the greater goal of saving humanity from the Trisalarn invasion, a project which she abandons. Obviously, leaving humanity in the lurch is at odds with Wang Miao's characterization in the book, but as previously stated, Augie is not Wang Miao. Jack. You want to know as well? Jack, I love you, but I swear to God, if you don't shut the fuck up, I'm going to punch a hole straight through your head. I can't believe you're working for that fascist fuck again. If you don't shut the fuck up, I'm going to punch a hole straight through your head. I started a company that manufactures them um, for a variety of potential medical energy and materials applications. Fuck him. I will give Benioff and Weiss credit for having the balls to kill Augie off though. Her death was so cathartic that it was almost worth enduring her presence in the show just to get the death scene. After fixing Mexico's water faucet, Augie decides she needs to destroy Wade and his enterprise, so she tools up and drives to the company parking lot. What follows is an awesome bloody shootout. In the end, Augie chooses to go out in a magnificent fucking blaze of glory rather than surrender. Oh, just beautiful stuff. If you don't shut the fuck up, I'm gonna punch a hole straight through you. There is an entire sequence with Augie going full boss bitch in the last episode, which was the worst scene in the show by a country fucking kilometre cubed and contained within the confines of a mini universe. Augie is so insufferable in this scene that it made me want to throw her into a death line so that every single particle of her being died and every trace of her existence disappeared from the universe forever. By all means, finish your tweet. Just doing what I have to do, what I should have been doing all along, and I'm taking my work with me. When Benioff and Weiss go completely off script and make shit up that is not in the book, they come up with the dumbest shit in the show, which looks even worse next to the way well thought out, coherent and creative plots of Xi Jin Liu. The worst incidence of this is Augie's smug rage quit. She goes to her company boss and tells him that she quits and she's putting all her nanotech research online for the whole world to use. 
With details of how to build the nanotech, she even provides instructions for poor countries to sue her company through the UN if the company tries to sue those countries for copyright. Augie, Benioff and Weiss all seem to think that third world countries are going to read Augie's online data leak, set up advanced nanotech laboratories and factories and begin manufacturing their own nanotechnology. For entirely humanitarian purposes of course, Jimmy Barbecue no doubt has only the most humane of intentions once he gets those high-tech nanotech labs pumping out weapons grade nanomaterials. Augie's entire plan here is impressively stupid. The company Augie works for can manufacture nanotech because it is located in a developed country with rule of law, relatively low levels of societal corruption, highly developed industry and trade, modern technology, reliable infrastructure and access to high level human material. If a shipping container full of nanotech parts arrives in port in Suffolk, the company can realistically expect all parts to arrive safely in their warehouse, then to their manufacturing facilities and thence to their clients. The same would not be expected in a third world country. Here is a video of a bridge collapsing as it is being inaugurated by a local political hack in the Democratic Republic of Congo. That pedestrian bridge did not collapse because the company building it were in want of bridge designs. Designs for pedestrian bridges can be accessed freely online. It collapsed because the DRC is a deeply corrupt society. Whatever company the government hired to build this bridge embezzled the funds and used only a small fraction of the project budget to create a public death trap. The DRC cannot even construct a bastard footbridge. But Augie thinks that as long as they have the designs and a hearty word of encouragement, hopelessly corrupt, impoverished nations can create advanced, cutting edge nanotech that will pull them out of poverty. Bear in mind, this nanotech is military military grade technology and would be in high demand on the black market. But it's okay, nothing bad will happen because... Come on. I don't want this video to turn into an essay on economic development and a debate about politics in developing nations, so I will sum up my own personal thoughts regarding Augie's political ideas thusly. <laughs> At the end of the show, Augie shows up to Mexico to cure the plague or something. She attaches a nanotech filter to Mexico's water faucet, thus ensuring clean drinking water for the whole country. For about five minutes until someone steals the immensely valuable rare piece of nanotechnology. You see, the problem with Augie is that she has neither read Thomas Saul nor watched this clip of him on YouTube. They don't ever get to that second stage because once they've seen something that fits their conception of how the world works, that's sort of the end of it. I don't know if Augie's ass has Wi-Fi, since that is where her head is perpetually located, having entered that region of her body in order to inhale the fumes of her putrefying feculence. I hope it does have Wi-Fi so that Augie can watch that Thomas Saul clip and thereafter ask herself. So, okay, I fix Mexico's water, then what happens? While pondering this question, she can have a vision of Thomas Saul saying, It is irrelevant what the initial intentions of the water filtration project were. A rare and highly valued piece of equipment has been introduced into an extremely impoverished area. The likelihood is that whatever local gang controls the area will remove the water filter immediately and sell it thereafter, or take possession of the pump and charge extortionate prices for the use of the town's only potable water. Even if a gang does not steal the filter, the area will enter a kind of prisoner's dilemma. Everyone in the area knows the filter is valuable and that someone will steal it. Therefore, everyone is thinking, better if I take it before anyone else can. At least my family's water will be clean. It is an absolute certainty that the filter will not be on the faucet the next day. Augie suffers from the vision of the anointed. She believes herself to be carrying out cosmic justice in a community that has been deprived of it. Therefore, the basic laws of economics do not apply to her schemes. If she took a more level-headed approach, one in which she does not play the part of the self-appointed messiah, she would have used a much cheaper filter which wouldn't have been worth stealing and distributed spare filters around the community. This filter would have been less effective on paper than the nano filter, but in practice would have saved many more lives. In other words, it should belong to everybody. I'm afraid that's not how it works. It does if I give it to them. Sue everyone. Sue all the governments of the developing world. That'll make you popular. 
Let's move on to the next most awful creative liberty if that- shut the fuck up, I'm gonna punch a hole straight through your head. Let's move on to the next most awful creative liberty Benioff and Weiss have taken, the creation of the friend group. No one told you that was gonna be this way. Quick note, in order to avoid confusion, I will be referring to the Netflix show Three Body Problem as 3BP and to the novel as the Three Body Problem. I considered calling this show Game of Problem, but for fear of conjuring images of the season of television that must not be named, I ultimately decided against it. Benioff and Weiss have taken the main character from each book and dumped them all together into the same friend group, which they build the story around. The main character from the first book, The Three Body Problem, is Wang Miao, a nanotech scientist who is recruited into the ETO, the Earth Trisolaris Organization. A group of traders working with the alien invader. Wang is recruited by Da Xu, an anti-terrorism detective, to spy on the ATO. As thus far demonstrated, Wang was absolutely fucking crucified in 3BP. His character was abominated and became Augie, who bears no resemblance to Wang in sexual anatomy, lifestyle, behavior, personality, or critical thinking capacity. The main character in the second book of the trilogy, The Dark Forest, is Luoji, my favorite character from the entire trilogy. Luoji is the last wall facer and ultimately saves humanity. He later becomes the sword holder and safeguards humanity against Trisolaran attack for almost 60 years. Following that, he becomes a symbol for the human resistance fighters who carry on a hopeless war against Trisolaran conquest during the post-deterrence era. My favorite scene in the entire trilogy is the one in which Luoji defeats the Trisolarans by threatening to unleash the universal broadcast in the graveyard where Ye Win Jie is buried. Luoji is turned into Saul. Saul shares some superficial character traits with Luoji, but the characterization overall is botched, and Saul is ultimately a failed transposition of a brilliant character. I'll talk in depth about Luoji's failed characterization in the next section. The main character from the third book, Death's End, is Chung Shin, an aerospace engineer who is hired by the PI and put to work on the Staircase project, which aims to send a human brain to the Trisolarans at 1% light speed. She proposes using nuclear explosions in space to accelerate the probe, and her idea is accepted. She is frozen in hibernation as a PIA liaison to the future. Chung Shin is, by far, the worst character in the remembrance of Earth's past book trilogy. She is boring, has little characterization beyond her excessive sentimentality and empathy, is largely sexless, doesn't learn from her mistakes, and her character journey breaks immersion because it is so ridiculously lacking in believability. More on Chung Shin and the fairly bad final book in the trilogy, Death's End, later on in the video. Chung Shin is turned into Cheng Jin, who is one of the stronger characters in the show, and a considerable improvement on the insufferable wisp of a character from the novel. The wallflower of the group is Will. Will is based on Yun Tian Ming, a terminally ill engineer who is selected for the Starcase project. Will matches Yun Tian Ming almost perfectly. Yun is an unambitious, withdrawn, socially awkward, underachiever and friend zone type. He's the guy you're referring to when you say, nice guys finish last. He is a boring person but a good character. Not everyone is fun and interesting. Some people are just boring, and having a character like that pop up in fiction occasionally infuses it with a sense of realism. Will is hopelessly besotted with Jean, but this is very much a friend zone situation. Jean is just not interested in a wimpy wallflower who has all the masculine sexual energy of Jaden Smith. You're wrong! The dynamic between Will and Jean is an almost exact replica of the relationship between Chung Shin and Yun Tian Ming in the books. The friend group is rounded out by Jack, who is based on a very minor passing character from the start of Death's End, a soda magnate and friend of Yun Tian Ming, to whom he gives a large amount of money. Jack is the most likable character in the show. He's played excellently by John Bradley and is the only member of the friend group with anything approaching charisma. In terms of character quality, the friend group is a very mixed bag, ranging in quality from quite good in the case of Jack to absolutely dreadful. The main problem in tossing all the most important characters from the trilogy together in this little clique is that it's lazy, wasteful, and sets the show up for immersion break. Of this single friend group of five people, four of them will be called on as major players in Earth's planetary defense against the Trisolar invasion. Augie and Jean are employed at the highest echelons of the PIA, 
the Planetary Defense Council Intelligence Agency, Will is selected as the brain that will be sent to the Trisalaran fleet in a probe, and Saul is chosen as a wall facer. Three of them, Jean, Saul, and Will, turn out to be three of the most consequential people in human history. Saul will go on to defeat the Trisalarans as wall facer, Will will go on to provide solar humans with their last chance to save themselves, and Jean will make two of the worst decisions in history, leading to the total annihilation of human life in the solar system. And these people all just happened to hang out together before the Trisolar Crisis? They would all have a greater chance of simultaneously surviving a battle royale Haitian cookout in the Australian outback than of all being selected as indispensable instruments of human defence. It's ridiculous. The only way this can work is if this friend group has some sort of divine mandate which of course they don't, the PIA, with essentially infinite resources and access to the entirety of the pool of human expertise, are going to find better and more qualified people. Can they really not do any better than a Mexican supermodel to head their nanotech program? The other problem the friend group arc introduces is Indian sitcom drama. I would rather spend an hour posing for a needle eye portrait than go over that drama in anything resembling detail, so here is a very brief summary of the vapid interpersonal drama in 3BP that I could not give the mass of a two-dimensional slice in shit for. Augie's feelings about working for Wade, Jean's feelings about Augie's feelings about working for Wade, Jean and Raj's relationship drama, Augie and Saul's will they won't they verbal sparring sessions, the relationship between Dashu and his gay son. Dashu's son's feelings about Dashu's feelings about his son's ridiculously stupid attempt at a business enterprise, promising human beings planets on Mars because the aliens are just going to ignore Mars. Like, what a fucking ridiculously stupid idea. As Dashu puts it very well. This is impressive, Rich, that you've done this all on your own. But it is bollocks. Will's unrequited love for Jean and Jean's feelings toward Will. Saul and Augie's feelings about Will's feelings about Jin. Will's feelings about Saul and Augie's feelings about his feelings about Jean. That's not to say all the human relationship drama in the show is bad. Some of it is genuinely good and helps with characterization and building stakes. Jack and Will's relationship drama is heartfelt and bromantic and Jack's determination to help Will pull through his stage 4 cancer diagnosis was genuinely moving. You're not giving up on your own fucking life. Jack's empathy for and strong support of his dying friend is one of the reasons he was the show's most likeable character. Jack and Jean's relationship built around trying to crack the three body game was also good because it was funny, relatable and entertaining. Jack and Jean did have good chemistry and played well off each other and I actually laughed out loud at this joke. Did they figure it out? Not according to modern physics. They'd still need the starting parameters of all three bodies. Will you shut the fuck up, troll? Our computer works. And this. Promise me you'll stop playing, please. All right, fine, I'll stop. The sword lady said we're supposed to use science to save the next civilization, right? Both are well-timed comic beats and this feeling of an almost pathological addiction to a video game will be familiar to anyone who has ever been addicted to a game. There are tens of billions of genocide victims who would attest to my addiction to 4X games, such as Civilization and Total War, if they could. But recreational genocide is a young man's game. Unfortunately, I no longer have the strength of will required to stay up till 4am in order to starve the entire Russian population to death. Video game addiction is a minor theme in the first book. There is a scene in the book in which Wang Miao is threatened with permanent expulsion from Three Body, a prospect which horrifies him. When Jack is murdered, you actually cur, an aspect of 3BP that does merit praise. The only part of the friend group that really worked was Jean, Jack and Will. It's also reasonably lore accurate. In the third book, those three characters attend university together, though they don't hang out after university. The constant hanging out is another major problem with the friend group. How do these people have so much time on their hands? Wang Miao, a nanotech physicist, spends almost all his time working. When he's not working, he's with his family. What little free time he has, he spends on his amateur photography. But Augie, the brilliant nanotech supermodel, has time to hang out with the guys all day, sit around with Wallfacer Saul talking shite, and go to bars so she can inflate her ego by embarrassing random men for the crime of approaching her. And when she gets put into protective custody after the ETO bust, 
What does she do all day? Does she pore over the falsified particle reactor data that has clearly been sabotaged by the Trisolarin Sophons like a good PhD level physicist? No. She sits around drinking, getting stoned and whining. To be fair, in the books, Luoji is a wastrel when we are introduced to him. When he is chosen as wall facer, he openly admits to the UN Secretary General that he is a hack academic who writes half-assed, crappy papers based on sensationalist source material so he can, in his own words, muddle through. He is twice divorced with no kids and devotes much of his time to indulging in short flings. He is something approaching a nihilist. 3BP does depict these more obvious aspects of Luoji G's characterization in its transposition of him, Saul. Saul is a layabout stoner, he has a one night stand with a girl and seems quite eager to get rid of her when he's done with her. He is a second raider who is quite content to take some job in a particle accelerator and he expresses a nihilistic attitude toward humanity. What if you have one kid and that one kid has one kid? Eventually humanity will die out and then we don't even have to worry about these aliens. This is both good and correct, but unfortunately that is where Saul's characterization stops in 3BP. The creators miss the more subtle but just as if not more important aspects of Luoji's character. Luoji is cunning, he is good at psychological manipulation, this is foreshadowed in the books in his character introduction, he perfectly times the duration of his one night stand relationships, manipulating the girls so that they take off voluntarily on cue without him having to go through an awkward breakup scene. He also manipulates public opinion in his profession. He selects sensationalist topics for his papers because he knows it will get him noticed, garner him reputation and ensure his position, which is how he survives in the publisher parish world of academia. One such paper on the topic of cosmic civilization theory, that is how alien civilizations would theoretically interact with one another, written before the Trisolar Crisis, gets him noticed by the Trisolarans, who instruct the ATO to assassinate him out of fear that he will discover the secret of dark forest deterrence. These character traits are what make Luoji ultimately a successful wall facer. He is able to manipulate the human public into thinking he has given up on his wall facer duties, which in turn fools the Trisolarans. He puts on an act playing the part of the depressed loser, driven to alcoholism and depression out of pining for his wife and child who are in hibernation. He turns his home into a pigsty of discarded cigarette butts, empty drink bottles and filthy clothes. This is a smokescreen behind which he builds the weapon of dark forest deterrence. The Trisolarans do not become aware of this until Luoji literally has his finger on the trigger and threatens to annihilate both Earth and Trisolaris. It's beautiful. Luoji has a dark passenger who travels with him on his journey as wall facer. The dark character traits that foreshadow the psychological elements of Luoji's victory as wall facer are completely absent from Saul. This is both bad and incorrect. Saul can seduce women but has no ability to psychologically manipulate them. He ends up arguing with the redhead he had a one night stand with, becoming emotionally invested in the conversation. This is just poor. Luoji takes pleasure not just in the sex he has with his women but in with them and he doesn't argue with these women because to do so would be an expenditure of emotional energy that Luoji at that point in his life does not have. He just doesn't care. Saul is too simple minded, brooding and emotional to be a good wall facer. He's too much of a good guy. He doesn't have the cunning of a wall facer. He has no dark passenger. We will next examine Jean. 3BP's version of Chung Shin. By the way, that's how her name is pronounced in the audiobook, so that's what I'm going with. In order to contextualize 3BP's adaptation of Chung Shin, I must first explain why Chung Shin is an abysmal character, the worst in remembrance of Earth's past trilogy, and why the final book in that trilogy, Death's End, is a catastrophe. The Three Body Problem and The Dark Forest are both masterpieces, but we must not allow our love for those books to blind us to the glaring issues with Death's End. The main character in Death's End, Chung Shin, is awful. She is teeth gratingly stupid. The novel also fails at world building. The geopolitics and sociology of the world are terrible. Firstly, humanity would never have chosen Chung Shin as sword holder. In the novel, her selection is explained by the fact that humanity has become effeminized and weak and that sentimentalism has taken hold and trapped the public in a kind of waking dream. This is total bullshit. That is not how humanity would behave while engaged in a cold war with tri 
Solaris, humanity was a few years away from being exterminated by the arrival of eight Trisolaran droplets, which would have wiped all human life from the Earth to prepare the planet for Trisolaran colonization. Such an event would turn humanity into an almost pathologically paranoid species. No one would trust the Trisolarans. Different countries would insist on having their own dark forest deterrence system, and they would fight to defend it. Are you seriously going to suggest that Russia, China, Japan, America, France, the UK, and India aren't going to absolutely insist on their own dark forest deterrence system after the doomsday battle and the near conquest of Earth? Even if a single deterrence system controlled by one sword holder was established, no one is selecting Chung Shin. Who is this woman? She has no military experience. She is not a strategist or tactician. She clearly isn't someone you would describe as ruthless. And yet humanity put their trust in her to be the sole barrier of defense against Trisolaran attack because she's nice. Following humanity's near extermination by the Trisolarans, human scientists accept advanced scientific information from Trisolaris and they never question its validity. Information which humanity discovers much later is false and Trisolaris Solaris spin a tale to humanity of how the import of human culture into Trisolaris has changed Trisolaran society and now they love peace and democracy and make movies with human characters which they send to Earth. Come on, Earth is now ripe for the plucking. Nonsense. No one would trust the Trisolarans. Any science humanity receives from them would be discarded immediately as falsified and intended to waste humanity's scientific resources, or more likely, a Trojan horse. Any art they send would be rightly regarded as part of a psyop, intended to convince humans of Trisolaris's newfound softness and good intentions, and thus get humanity to let their guard down. A movie made in Trisolaris and sent to Earth could even be a weapon weapon and contain advanced subliminal elements intended to manipulate humans into self-sabotage, any interaction with Trisolaran science or culture would be rightly outlawed and following the lifting of the Sophon lock, humanity would press ahead aggressively and fanatically with scientific research in the hope of catching up to Trisolaris before that rapacious species of alien scum inevitably launch another invasion. When Chung Shin fails in her duty as sword holder, when she literally throws away the universal broadcast trigger and simply allows Trisolaris to take possession of the Earth with droplets they deviously hid in the solar system, no one kills her. No one takes revenge against this woman that condemned humanity to the great resettlement and near extinction through her own sheer spinelessness. Really? No one whose child was murdered by a droplet or died in the Australian outback managed to get close enough to Chung Shin to pay her the wages of her failure as wall facer. And later on, this same woman whose cowardice led to the death of millions and brought humanity to the brink of extinction, the bumbling incompetent who ran for an office she was not fit for out of a misplaced sense of historical importance despite warnings from the other sword holder candidates that she wasn't fit for the office. A woman whose treacherous weakness led to the immense tragedy of the Great Resettlement in which millions died, in which humanity was subjugated and humiliated. A woman who failed humanity utterly. This person is allowed to meet with Sophon as humanity's ambassador to the Trisolarans? Are you fucking kidding me? No. No one would allow this. No one would trust her. Many would think, justifiably, that she was a Trisolaran agent. And later, she is allowed to walk into the Halo Group headquarters and order humanity's last hope to surrender to the Solar Fleet, a fleet they could easily destroy. And by doing so, she obliterates any possibility that humanity will achieve light speed travel before the coming Dark Forest strike. No. Just no. This is nonsense. 
a Lightspeed Loyalist would do all of humanity a big favor and assassinate her. She would be killed while in hibernation, or her shuttle would be blown up in space before she got to Halo City, or she would be assassinated shortly after arrival, even if she was allowed to meet Wade and order him to surrender to the government forces, one of the soldiers in the room would kill her then and there because the soldiers knew, just like Wade and everyone else in that room knew, that lightspeed travel was humanity's best hope, if not their only hope. They would not let the sentimental foppery of one stupid little bitch stand in the way of humanity's survival and triumph. And Chung Shin never pays for her mistakes. All of solar human civilization is wiped out, every man, woman and child, but she gets to go on living. That is unjust. The reader deserved the catharsis of Chung Shin's death. The reader earned that catharsis by putting up with such an insufferable, incompetent moron for so long, and that catharsis was denied us. Unjust! After humanity confirms that a dark forest strike is on the way, and they have no defense against it, they have three options. They can slow down the speed of light in the solar system, thus creating a barrier against all threats. This is examined, but deemed impossible. The two remaining options are the bunker option and the light speed option. The bunker option is to build space cities and shelter them behind Jupiter, so that humanity can survive when a photoid strikes the sun and ignites it like a bomb. The light speed option is to build light speed ships, get as many people out of the solar system as possible, and make for the stars, the ultimate hope being to find and colonize faraway planets. In the book, humanity chooses the bunker option and ban all research on light speed travel and even ban humans from leaving the solar system, deeming it escapism. This is utter nonsense. These policies would have next to no support. The vast majority of people would choose escape on lightspeed ships. Even if only a small fraction of humanity could get away, people would support this. No one wants to go live on a rotating tin can behind Jupiter in a solar system with no sun and no earth. There is no future in that. People would know instinctively that there is no future in that. Human beings are terrestrial. They want ground under their feet and sky overhead. A new earth to call home. Entire countries would reject the bunker plan and form an alliance with other like-minded countries. These alliances would then get to work researching lightspeed travel. Presidents would be elected on a platform of total rejection of the bunker plan and the pursuit of lightspeed and the construction of enough ships to get everyone in the country off into the cosmos. It's obviously not realistic that you could transport every citizen or even most citizens off world, but it's what voters want to hear and politicians would be happy to sell it to them. Humanity knows for a fact that light speed travel is possible because the second Trisolarn fleet was approaching at light speed and the idea that humanity could develop it for themselves is realistic. If, for example, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia and New Zealand all elected pro light speed governments and pooled their resources, they would almost certainly achieve light speed within a century possibly a lot sooner. Support for a bunker plan would not get beyond an international cabal of corrupt billionaire elites. Every single country would oppose it, but in death's end, almost the entire human race, all governments, all nations, agree to the bunker plan and go to live in space cities behind Jupiter. That's just fucking dumb. And Xi Jinping's overall description of the universe as an inherently evil place that is in a constant, inevitable process of collapse toward one-dimensional space is profoundly nihilistic and depressing, and the promise of the great universe reborn in 10th dimensional reality is insufficient consolation, because it just starts the whole process all over again. Chung Shin is an awful character, and Death's End is an awful book. As bad as Chung Shin is, she is an essential character to the book series, but in adapting Chung Shin, the creators of 3BP have a serious problem. How to adapt a flat, boring, lifeless character? The showrunners deal with this problem by actually giving Jean some characterization beyond she's loving and kind. They give her a lover, they give her some childhood trauma, her parents died in a flood when she was a girl and she was adopted. She interacts with the three-body game, which depicts her as intellectually curious, obsessive, and someone who doesn't give up, but also as perhaps excessively sentimental. She becomes very attached to a little girl in the game and wants to save her, despite 
despite the fact that, as Jack points out, the girl is just digital information. This is a particularly nice touch because it sets up the self-destructive empathy and sentimentalism that will eventually pay off when Chung Shin refuses to unleash the universal broadcast against the Trisolarans, because that would be mean. Jean's interactions with Jack in Three Body are excellent. This is the TV show at its best. Her friendship with Will is also good and helps endear the character to the audience and depict her deep felt love of life that will one day condemn humanity to enslavement. Jean is definitely an improvement on Chung Shin from the novel. Problems arrive from her interactions with the bloated friend group. Any time she spends with Augie or Saul is time wasted. These scenes are excessive and make the show feel like it's slowed to a crawl at times. These interactions do nothing for her characterization and essential information exposited in these scenes would have been better done with Jean in PIA meetings or in conversation with Raj, who is probably an adaptation of Zhang Beihai, a major character in the second book. Moving on now to Lost Opportunities. As suggested by the title of this video, Three Body Problems Problem isn't that it's an outright terrible show, it's that it should be much better. There was a lot of potential with the character of Tatiana. In the novel, The Three Body Problem, Liu Shijin gives a lot of characterization to the ETO. The organization has two main factions, redemptionists who believe that the Trisolarans can redeem mankind, the Lord will conquer the earth and become a benevolent ruler that will oversee humanity's transformation from a cruel, barbaric and backward species to an enlightened civilization, saved by the grace of the Lord and remade in the Lord's image. The other faction, which quickly becomes the sole faction in the ETO, are the Adventists who want Trisolaris to wipe out humanity. They are misanthropes who want to take revenge against humanity for their own shitty lives or for humanity's crimes against nature. The Redemptionists are revealed as being naive idiots. Far from being enlightened saviors from the stars, the Trisolaran civilization is a brutal, totalitarian dictatorship. They have no literature, no leisure, no philosophy, no enjoyment of life, and are socio-politically stagnant. Emotionalism is regarded as weakness. Any dissent is punished with death. There is only one penalty for those who break the law, death by dehydration and burning. This is a far more bleak, hopeless and authoritarian society than that imagined by Orwell in 1984. A fairly good historical parallel for the ETO is the urban middle class Russians who turned to Bolshevism after the 1917 Russian Revolution. They believed that by rejecting the antiquated czarist system and embracing the promised utopia of communism, they would create a paradise on earth. The reality was quite different. In the novel, ETO members are the naive Russian who looks to the the future with starry-eyed expectation following Lenin's seizure of power. They are the Extinction Rebellion activist who climbs atop a train full of broke working stiffs to punish them for the crime of their existence. They are the self-flagellating attention seeker who glues herself to a road to prevent ambulances from getting heart attack sufferers to a nearby hospital. They hate humanity, and they idolize the Trisolarans both as a means of coping with their own self-hatred and to give themselves purpose in a world where they have lost faith in human endeavor. There are scenes in the novel in which Adventists speak of how much they despise humanity. In the show, the inherent misanthropy of ETO members is present in the characters of Mike Evans and Ye Win Jae, but not Tatiana. This is a missed opportunity. A fleshing out of Tatiana's character should have been coupled with exposition concerning the Trisolarans. There is some characterization of the Trisolarans, but not enough. We learn that they struggle to comprehend the concept of lying, that they fear humanity because of the human ability to lie and withhold information, that they believe themselves superior to humanity and are utterly ruthless and intent on exterminating humanity. This is decent, but we need more. In the novel, there is a scene in which the Trisolaran princeps interrogates the pacifist who sent the do not respond warning to Earth. During in the interrogation, we learn of the tyrannical nature of Trisolaran government and society. This could have been adapted in a TV show. After Augie leaves the PIA, she is secretly contacted by Tatiana. They meet up and quickly begin a romantic relationship. This will be both LGBTQ inclusive and smoking hot. After meeting up, Tatiana and Augie spend the evening drinking and sharing stories of how terrible humanity is. They even make a game of it. One will give... That game is over. 
and a new game's about to begin. The wire saw that's wrapped around your neck will first cut into your skin, then your vertebral ligaments, and finally it'll sever your spinal cord. John, did you kidnap David Benioff and D.B. Weiss and put them in your machines? No. I, uh, I help people overcome inner obstacles. Help them make positive... John, I can see them. You have attached buckets to their heads. They are clearly in a state of great distress. Look, Three Body Problem was not Game of Thrones Season 8. It made some major mistakes, but was ultimately an honest, decent attempt at... There's a sickness inside you that needs to be excised. You have the... John, take them out of the machines. I'm coming back here at the end of the video, and I expect to see them released. As I have explained before, John, this is not how we deal with creative failure. So, in Augie and Tatiana's game, one gives a reason why humanity shouldn't be wiped out by the Lord, and the other must drink if she can't come up with a rebuttal. So Augie leans toward Tatiana and says, Well, some female humans are really hot. I can't argue with that. My turn. Humans make really good alcohol. What? Have you tasted Budweiser? I'd rather someone pissed in my mouth than drink that. Oh, really? We cut to the next scene. Sofon is in on the action now. She's shouting aggressive instructions to the girls from the TV set. Tatiana is squatting directly above Augie's wide open mouth and ejecting a straight- <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, sorry, I got a bit carried away. What was I talking about? Followed by an utterly cathartic lesbian embrace in which the two beautiful women become so intertwined in each other's physical forms that they could be mistaken for a pair of trisolarns engaged in reproduction. Sofon has her samurai sword out now, using its hilt as a di- Shortly after their lesbian awakening, Tatiana invites Augie to play a secret level of three body, reserved only for the truest of believers in the Lord. She places the VR helmet on Augie's head, and Augie is witness to the scene from the novel, with human analogues in place of Trisolarans, of course. She learns about the brutal dictatorship that rules Trisolaris, about the complete lack of compassion, mercy, art, diversion, and restraint in their society, and their plan to utterly annihilate humanity. When Augie, shocked removes the helmet, Tatiana, in a state of elated religious rapture, exclaims, They're not coming to save us. They're coming to destroy us. Augie hesitates for a few seconds, then launches herself at Tatiana with a brutal aggression emanating from her being. They fall to the ground and enter a lesbian embrace so passionate that they look like two beautiful women who have been fused together. They tear at one another's clothing, their utter devotion and surrender to the will of their alien overlord expressed in frenzied, almost violent sexual... Showing the pacifist Trisolaran interrogation also pays off the do not respond setup. The warning message from Trisolaris demonstrates that the Trisolarans are not a hive mind and there is such a thing as divergence of opinion in their society. It also creates curiosity in the reader. What individual sent this message and why? Beyond the obvious that the Trisolaran is a pacifist. Why is he a pacifist? What about the Trisolaran society has made him a pacifist? What are his motivations? Does the Trisolaran Trisolaran fleet perhaps belong to an intra trisolaran rival political entity that the ostensible pacifist seeks to hinder? These are interesting questions. In the book, the reader is given interesting and satisfying answers. In the Netflix series, the viewer is given nothing. The interrogation of the pacifist also sets up the epilogue of the Dark Forest, in which Luoji has a conversation with the pacifist on the topic of love, among other things. It's a beautiful scene, and 3BP should have gone out of its way to set up the exchange between Luoji and the pacifist so that it has greater emotional impact at the end of season 2. There is plenty of crap the writers could have removed from the script to make room for a deeper exploration of Trisolar in society and better characterization of Tatiana. And smoking hot lesbian sex. Tatiana could have been set up as one of the wall breakers in season 2, that is, the operatives the ETO appoint to uncover the plans of the wall facers and expose those plans to the world. Even if the showrunners didn't want to make Tatiana a wall breaker, exploring her psychology would have revealed the sheer fanaticism and dedication of the ETO, making the payoff of the wall facer wall breaker showdown all the more satisfying. All interaction between Jean, Augie and Saul should have been cut. Much of the show's bloat comes from 
from these scenes. For example, in one scene, Augie and Saul are playing Will They Won't They across the table, despite the fact that they have all the sexual chemistry of Timothy Chalamet and a peach, while Will hangs around batting away suggestions that he confess his love for Jean. Scenes like this are too boring and accomplish too little. They have no business existing when we could be looking at an ETO meeting in which the members discuss their hatred of humanity, or a Trisolaran pacifist protesting the miserable life conditions imposed on all Trisolarans by the survivalist regime of the Princeps, or a digitalized vision of Trisolaris's brutalist civilization. All interaction between Will, Augie, and Saul should have been cut. Will should have been alone after Jack's murder. Jean is too busy to spend any time with him. This would have emphasized his loneliness and despair following the death of Jack. Will would feel so crushed by Jack's death and Jean's apparent indifference to him that he actively embraces the idea of Canadian healthcare as a means of ending the emotional and sexual pain that is his existence as a prisoner of the friend zone and a man left adrift by a cruel society that has no time for weak men. Cutting the friend group down to size also takes care of the believability issue I discussed earlier. Briefly restated, a single friend group of five people is not very likely to produce four prospective saviours for humanity. Five if you count Raj, who is probably Jiang Beihai. The build up to the attack on Judgment Day was badly mishandled. This was an easy win for the showrunners and they completely botched it. In the book, Wang is brought to a meeting of high level military officers and intelligence operatives. They discuss the importance of seizing the hard drive containing almost all the intelligence on the Trisolarans. The difficulty is that the hard drive is probably deep within the massive ship and as soon as they launch an attack to seize it, the ETO will destroy the hard drive, something they could accomplish in seconds simply by unloading a gun magazine into it. The assembled experts discuss various options, including gassing, special ops, and experimental weapons, but nothing is likely to achieve the goal of seizing control of the ship quickly and in total secrecy in order to preserve the hard drive data. Dash Shu comes up with a simple, elegant solution. Tie a nanofiber between two posts placed either side of the river and sever everyone in the ship. This scene explains to the reader why the nanofiber is the only good option and is important in the characterization of Da Shu, who one of the attendees calls a demon. The many military and intelligence officials from around the world gathered in the same room also communicates the extensive efforts being made on a global scale to combat the Trisolaran threat. 3BP replaces this intense scene with Augie bitching and moaning to Wade. The ETO raid is a much better scene in the book. The police rush in and take control of the room. A young woman, an ETO member, grabs a large metal ball. This is one of three balls which represent the Trisolaran system. It's basically a 3D flag. The girl holds the ball above her head and declares that it is a small nuclear bomb and that she will trigger it if the authorities don't let the assembled ETO members walk out of there. During the standoff, Dashu asks asks a bomb expert present how to disarm the bomb. The expert says that if they shoot the bomb, that should disarm it. It will damage the exterior, but the internal process required for nuclear fission will not be triggered. Da Shu addresses Bomb Girl, removes a piece of paper from his pocket, says, we found your mother, and holds out the paper to her. This clearly has a great emotional impact on Bomb Girl, and when an ETO man comes over to take the piece of paper, Dasha waits until the man blocks Bomb Girl's line of sight, then pulls out a gun and shoots the bomb. It's a great scene. It's tense and entertaining. It depicts the ruthlessness and dedication of the ETO and, importantly, the presence of the bomb indicates that the ETO have access to the planet's best scientific minds. This is not a disorganized rabble. This is an extremely formidable organization with vast resources at their disposal. The scene is also important for the characterization of Da Shu. Outside, after the raid, Wang asks about Bomb Girl and her mother. Da Shu explains that the piece of paper was just a random bit of paper, that he has no idea who Bomb Girl is, but that he has seen many girls like that in his career, and he could tell to look at her that she had serious mommy issues. We learn here that Da Shu isn't just some cop, he's an anti-terrorism expert, has great instinct, and is willing to take unilateral action when the situation requires it. Instead of this wonderful scene, 3BP does a generic police raid, which descends into a run-of-the-mill shootout. Benioff 
Stephen Weiss need to learn to stop doing paint by numbers shootouts and love the bomb. Regarding the characterization of Dasha instead of the nail biting bomb girl exchange, Benioff and Weiss gave us boring conversations with gay son. Ali's a twat. Yeah, you've been saying that for two years, but he's still my boyfriend, so what does that tell you? There. Far better. The worst omission from the book is the absence of the very first scene. At the start of the three-body problem, a young teenage girl stands atop the wall of a fortified building enclosure, waving a huge red flag. She is participating in a battle of the Red Guard faction wars. The entire enclosure has been wired with bombs. If the besiegers enter the compound, the bombs will be triggered, killing both the invaders and and the defenders. After screaming some vapid red guard slogan, the girl is hit by a single bullet. She dies immediately and falls from the wall. The faction that shot her take her body and mount it on the spiked railings of the compound gate and shoot it some more. We learn later in the book that this girl was the younger sister of Ye Win Je. This is an extremely important scene. The defensive tactic of wiring the entire compound with bombs is foreshadowing of Luo Ji's victory against Trisolaris through the use of dark forces forest deterrence, which, when triggered, will ensure the annihilation of both Earth and Trisolaris. Ye Win Jie's sister is a metaphor for and foreshadow of the ETO. She is a traitor. We learn later in the book that she betrayed her own father, denouncing him as a reactionary. She does this not out of self-preservation, but genuine ideological conviction. But she's too emotional, she's too fanatical, and ends up getting herself killed. The death of Ye Win Jie's sister has a rhyming couplet later in the book bomb girl. The bomb she holds up is one of three metal balls symbolizing Trisolaris, the equivalent of the ETO flag. When Dasha shoots the bomb, the girl's arms are blown off by the resulting explosion, which kills her. Two young girls, both ideologically possessed fanatics, both highly emotional, both killed in battle while waving the flag. These rhyming dramatic beats emphasize an important political point that Liu Shijin makes in Three Body Problem. He draws a parallel between the Red Guards of the Chinese Cultural Revolution and the ETO of his book series. The Red Guards wanted to destroy all that was old, utterly eradicate old culture and ways of thinking, and create a new China, free from the past, reborn under the guiding light of Maoism. The ETO want to utterly destroy human society and remake it in the image of the Lord, Trisolaris. Some want to help the Trisolarans eradicate humanity entirely and remake the very Earth itself. The book's opening scene is important to the characterization of Ye Win Jie. She sees her father murdered by the Red Guards in a struggle session. She is betrayed by a close friend. She is tortured for the crime of refusing to denounce her dead father. And although it happens pre-narrative, she witnessed her sister being swallowed up by the Maoist cult and betray the family. Then later hears of how her sister died on some God-forsaken battlefield of a children's war. Ye Win Jie is a woman who has lost all hope in humanity. It's possible we'll get Ye Win Jie's sister's death scene at the start of season two, as it would couple nicely with Saul's victory as Wallfacer. But the scene should have been the opening scene to the show, followed by the struggle session. For all its faults, some aspects of 3BP are excellent, and these merit mentioning. With the obvious exception of Isa Gonzalez, the casting is generally great. Liam Cunningham is excellent as Wade. His levels of charisma, aggression, presence, and gravitas all match that of Wade. Benedict Wong is superb as Da Xu, who was a very true adaptation of the book character. Jonathan Price was very well cast as Mike Evans, and both actresses who played Ye Win Jie were very good. Zine Zeng, who played young Ye Win Jie, was particularly outstanding. All of the China scenes depicting the life of young Ye Win Jie were excellent. They were the best part of the show. The struggle session the show opens with is absolutely brilliant. From the broad staging of the scene to the small details, that is a great scene. One small detail I liked is the frumpy clothes worn by Ye Win Jie's mother, the closest thing she could find to the ghastly, loose-fitting, amorphous, sexless uniform of the Red Guards. She dresses in this hideous attire in a clumsy attempt to imitate Red Guard chic and thus endear herself to the mob of bloodthirsty revolutionary youth and to further distance herself from her reactionary husband, who she betrays. This scene was cut from the Chinese Tencent adaptation, almost certainly as a result of CCP censorship, which is a deal-breaker for me. Robbing Ye Win Jie of her character motivation is bad enough, but to allow direct regime censorship of the script makes the show unwatchable. I 
utterly reject the Tencent adaptation. Sia Shimuka was the perfect Sofan. She perfectly captures Sofan's erratic, erotic and exotic blend of danger, elegance and beauty. Sofan is a truly bizarre character in the book and the surreal poses of the character in 3BP beautifully evokes Sufan's eccentric nature. She walks on lava and floats before the trisolar eclipse. These shots are absolutely gorgeous examples of visual symbolism done well. They are symbolic of how Sufan drifts elegantly through calamitous disasters in the book and retains her otherworldly grace throughout all of them. The shot of Sufan floating in front of the trisolar eclipse is a mini masterpiece in itself. The three suns are assembled in the frame so that they look like an eye. This is a visual metaphor for the Sufons, the particle sized computers the Trisolarans use to spy on humanity and sabotage human science, they're always watching. The role of the three sons as a representation of the Sofons is emphasised by the fact that Sofon is floating before them. In the books, Sofon is the Trisolaran ambassador to humanity, an AI activated inside a robot built by humans. Sofon is the voice and face of the Trisolarans. In the shot, she advances with the sons at her back. This symbolises the advance of the Trisolaran fleet toward humanity, the ever-present Sofons guiding their action. And of course, Sofon is wearing her samurai sword, a symbol of war and an indication that she, and thus the Trisolarans themselves, are a mortal threat. However, she is also very beautiful and dressed in an elegant, sexually enticing dress. While some people would look at Sofon here and see her as a threat, others would see only her beauty. Just as some humans, the ETO, see the Trisolarans not as a force of evil, but as an instrument of redemption or rapture. Another brilliant piece of visual symbolism was Will's drug-induced vision of himself floating across the sea in a giant origami boat. In the final book, Tian Ming sends a coded message to humanity in the form of fairy tales, explaining that humanity must attain lightspeed travel in order to escape a dark forest strike. A.A. and Chung Xin decode part of the message by placing an origami boat in a bath of soapy water. The soap propels the boat forward, which reveals to them Will's message of curvature propulsion hidden in the fairy tale. Will hopes that lightspeed travel will one day bring him and Jane together again. In 3BP, the origami boat is symbolic of several important elements in the story. It is a foreshadowing of Will's message about lightspeed travel. It is a visual metaphor of Will's journey through space, lost in the vastness of the cosmos, and it is a symbol of Will's hope that one day he will be reunited with Jean through the mechanism of lightspeed travel. The origami boat as a symbol of the relationship between Will and Jean is set up in the scene on the beach when they make origami boats together and float them into the sea. Almost all the main dramatic set pieces in 3BP were brilliantly staged. First contact with the Trisolarans, the aforementioned struggle session, Ye Win Jae's imprisonment, the attack on Judgment Day was actually improved by giving the victims of the attack on board the vessel some characterization. Showing the slaughter of children, albeit off camera, was extreme, certainly not something any viewer wants to see, but Wade carrying out an attack that he knows will result in the murder of many children does infuse an element of evil into his character, who, in the novel, is described as evil. I also liked the You Are Bugs sequence, with the Sufons unfolding into two-dimensional space and wrapping around the Earth. The Earth appearing to be trapped by the Sufon here is a visual metaphor for the Sufon lock on human science, which traps humanity in a state of technological inferiority, which will, barring a miracle, result in the annihilation of the human species and the colonization of the Earth by the Trisolarans. A potential plot hole this scene introduces is the possibility that the Sufons can interact physically with the three-dimensional world, which they of course can't. The hijacking of human electronics should have been explained as the result of a hack by the ETO, that they set up Trojan horses in media software all over the world using login details given to them by the Sufons. Not including this plot hole fix was a major blunder by the writers, if not an outright own goal. The wall facer sequence would have felt flat, rushed and baffling to some viewers, which it is. This is very much the correct approach. Staging the sequence like that allows the viewer to experience the wall facer program inception from the perspective of Saul. In the book, Luoji finds the whole experience bizarre and dreamlike and can barely remember it. It is depicted depicted exactly like this in the show. The video game world of Three Body was, next to the opening scene, my favourite part of the show. 
All of the main dramatic beats were present and correct. The human computer, the destruction of Trisolaran civilization in freezing cold and searing heat, the trisolar eclipse, dehydration and rehydration, all these wonderful, vivid scenes from the book were rendered beautifully in the show in visually captivating sequences. As a nice bonus, the rehydration scene features the Benioff and Weiss patented floppy cocks swinging joyfully in the wind, a little throwback easter egg for Game of Thrones fans. It is undeniably fashionable to hate on Benioff and Weiss. They ruined Game of Thrones, the season of television whose name we dare not speak was one of the worst crimes ever committed in the history of high entropy civilization, but three body problem is overall a decent effort, though an often unsuccessful one. It has not redeemed Benioff and Weiss, it certainly has not absolved them, but it has earned them a stay of execution. Speaking of which, John, I trust you followed my instructions and released Benioff and Weiss? What have you done? I, uh, I help people overcome inner obstacles.